better. Afternoon guys. Um, I've been asked to do a casting tuition video on the reasons why I cast, why I use a reducer, why I use grip tape on a rod, why I use a thummy, um, etc. So I'm going to run you through why I cast the way I do, why I set the rod up the way I do, um, and why uh, it suits me down to the ground. When it started a couple of years ago, um, I had a high swing pendulum cast, as you used to remember. But back in 2016, when I started weight training, my shoulders, my arms become very stiff. And the style of casting I had, where my arm followed the tip, which wasn't ideal, but it worked for me. Um, I couldn't do that no more because my arm was getting so stiff, my casting started going downhill. So when I used to travel to West Wales um, a couple of times a month, targeting the taupe, you couldn't do the high swing pendulum cast. So I developed a little laid back cast. Just a little swing, comes back underneath the rod, lower the tip, and it fires eight and 10 ounce leads with no problem whatsoever. And then if I was, for example, going to West Wales on a Saturday or a Sunday, and then I was coming to the channel in the week and using six and seven ounce leads, my casting was all over the place. So in between my shoulders getting too stiff and changing from 10 ounce to seven ounce, um, from T1000s to 900s, I thought I'm gonna find myself one cast and stick with it. So it don't matter where I go, what venue I'm on, what conditions, it doesn't matter if the wind's in my face, behind me, side on, if it's raining, if I'm using 10 ounces, 8 ounces, T1000, 900, doesn't matter. Today I'll be using my brand new 900s. This is my spare one. They've all been custom built by Dyle Huellen of Anglin Ambition. Um, I picked them up a few days ago. I actually used two yesterday out fishing, catching codlin. And this is the spare that hasn't been used yet. So we're about to uh, <laughs> give it a good few casts. Right, I'm gonna run you through the reason why I use grip where I do my hand placement. Remember, this is not the way I'm telling everyone should do it. This is the way I do it. So for example, someone says to me, why have you got the reel eight to 10 inches above the bottom? Why not higher up? Why do you need a reducer? Well, I can't cast short rods. Even when I was traveling to West Wales for eight to 10 years, I always had a reducer in my T1000s. Um, some of the marks were tight for casting because a rod was over 15 foot long with a reducer, but I can't use a short rod. My casting style, I can't use a short rod. I find with a short rod, you need to have a fast casting style. Now I'm a slow caster, you know, I like to gently swing it out, swing it back gentle and hit it at the end. You know, I'm not an aggressive caster, I'm more of technique and timing than I am power. So for example, I like to place the reel this far, if you, I'm going to explain something to you now, this is what I like to do. You see my hand there on the grip? how balanced that is. That's balancing on four fingers. There's the tip. You know, this is a long rod. This is 14 foot four without reducer. It's over 15 foot at the moment. That, so when I'm casting, that is where, so it's nice and balanced. So the tip, see, look at that. See, the tip's not heavy, the butt's not heavy. You find that if you push the reel further down towards the metal spigot, it will start doing that. So it'll make the tip really light when you're casting. So if I haven't got a reducer in, and the reel's, reel's further up here, the tip will become heavy, and the tip will be really heavy when you're casting. So this is not gonna suit everyone. This is what suits me. This is what suited me for over the years I've been fishing. So I always have the rod completely balanced, right in the middle of the grip there, and I always make sure the reel is on the centre of my chest and my arms fully extended when I'm casting. So I always use a grip on the rod 
because sometimes it hasn't got to be raining let's say it's a, a cold frosty night everything becomes damp and then the last thing you want is to miss time a cast because to be fair when you're standing on terrain like this it's very hard to get good foot in sometimes so if you come around with a cast and you slip the last thing you want to do with a damp rod is let go it's happened to me where I've come round, the rod has slipped out my hand because I've slipped, but I've kept hold of the rod in the cast like that, where I could have easily put the tip into the floor. So I've always, for years and years and years, I've always preferred a nice grip. Um, this is real. I don't know what the name is, so if any of you are in interested, drop me a private message. I've got the link on my Amazon. This stuff is amazing, even when it's wet, it, it literally grips the hand, it's really grips and then I always prefer to set a tape a piece of bike in a tube to the butt of the rod this actually goes underneath the the reel to the reel seat and then because I find when you load up the rod the last thing you want is to have uh, yeah you know you get sometimes you get a bit of black rubber on your shock leader it might not look pretty but it's saving your fingers from damage because we've all been there we've all rushed a cast or you've had a bit of thumb slip and you burnt your finger so you know to have that on your reel what's that you know and in, in the tube's only like four quid and you've got about 50 on it you know it saves you it saves you from messing your thumb up now going over to a reducer what i read up on reducers years ago um, it wasn't so much as to lengthen the rod and shorten the rod back I might be wrong you know back in the 80s when they used to tournament cast people with small hands they couldn't get their hand on the old big size abu type reels they couldn't get their thumb around the spool so what they did is they had the reel mounted on a reducer which is a very which is like a thin diameter so it was easier then to get your hand around the reducer and then around the reel but it's just convenient now that people are using them for fishing you can take them out when you cast you can leave them in when you cast some people say it's bad to leave a reducer in a rod when you're casting, but the rod doesn't bend here. You know, it bends from the midsection up. You know, there's no harm. I've always cast with a reducer in, always. You know, it saves you taking out the rod, dropping it down through the rocks, losing it, damaging it, st standing on it. Just leave it in. Just leave it in, it's not doing no harm, but that's personal preference. Coming down to the reel, that's a personal choice as well. I love the casting specials, as you all know. Loaded with 20 pound sport. I love the high vis line. I always have for years. I've been using Variva Sport for over 10 years now. Not once has it let me down. Not once has it snapped mid fight on a fish. Not once. I've had a cut on the bottom because when you're fishing over ground like this, it's going to happen. I've had toke to over 47 on it, eels just under 30 pound on it. Spur dogs, blondes over 20, hounds over 20. It's never, you know, rough ground, it's never ever let me down. You know, I like a high vis line. And that's paired up with um, 100 pound ASO Classic. I absolutely love this stuff. Some people might say, yeah, it's a bit thick, it does, don't get me wrong, sometimes it does rattle through the tips. But I very rare, you know, very rare do I blow up. Um, I prefer to have a strong leader to constantly take in big casts of 7 ounce, 8 ounce and sometimes 10 ounce. Um, and then when you, you know, if you're casting out 100, 120, 150 yards, the last 30, 40 yards in line is on the, is on the rough terrain. You don't want a 60 pound or a 70 pound shock leader fishing over rough ground, in my personal opinion, because you are going to get nicks and kinks in it from uh, scrap on the floor from rock sharp rocks, um, sharp shells, anything. So I would minimum use 80 pound, but my personal pref preference is it is 100 pound. So I'm gonna run you through casting fundamentals in the style that I do. It might help you, it might not. Some of you might agree, some of you might disagree. But this is not a video on how you should do it. This is a video on maybe I can give you some tips to help you with your casting. 
because um, I love helping people, I do. Um, I've had a lot of pes um, messages, <laughs> messages over the last six to seven weeks since I've been back. Um, saying I've inspired a lot of people to get back out fishing, try new things, go to new venues. Even this morning when I went to the gym, I bumped into a, into a lovely old guy called Lynn. You'll probably see this because uh, he likes watching the videos. Um, so yeah, but with the casting fundamentals, it's the same as building a house or building a wall. You can't build a house or build a wall without strong foundations. If you've got a weak foundation, as soon as you build a house, it's going to collapse. So the main thing you need to do is when you're casting, is to have good, good foot placement. If you've got the sea straight ahead of you, I find there's no point in standing side on. Because when you come around with a cast, that's as far as you can go. And then you're going to end up moving your left foot. And then that could cause you to slip. Like some of the places like here, where it's wet and it's got mud all over the rocks, down Stout, down Panaf, where it's just covered in weed, you need to get good, good foot placement. So I always have my left hand foot facing 12 o'clock, my right hand foot, depending, anywhere between one and two, sometimes three. And then I always got a little bend in my knees because I thought you can't cast straight legged. You bend your knees, you can twist more, if you get me. So when you come round, that left leg is still. But you find, if you cast and you're putting too much power into your cast, you'll see it, your right leg. So as you're coming round, as you're powering it, your right leg will come off the floor. It's a classic sign, in my opinion, of putting too much power into the cast too early. Like my, my cast is all timing technique and I hit it at the end. Sometimes I'm, if I'm a great, if, if I've got a headwind or a side wind, sometimes I will put a lot, a lot more power in and you'll see my heel come off the floor. Now and again, very rare, my foot does come off. That's because I'm putting too much power in too early. So when you're casting, make sure you start with a strong, firm foundation, which is your legs. A nice little twist in your body. So that could be from off the ground to a pendulum cast to a simple overhead. You know, you need to have strong, not strong legs, strong foundation. So I'm gonna go ahead now and just demonstrate the cast that I do. Uh, it's nice and simple. Like I said in the beginning of the video, it's the cast I did when I was down West Wales, taupe fishing. Um, and that's what I've stuck with ever since. Let's get on with the video. As I get myself into position, I make sure that my left leg is facing in a direction I want to cast, so at 12 o'clock, and my right leg in a position between two and three o'clock, and then I have a slight little bend in my knees, and as I twist my body to look away from the sea, I swing the lead out between one and two o'clock direction, and as the lead comes back towards me, I lower the tip, turn, and finish the cast. The most important thing you need to realize and do while casting is to make sure that your footing, your foundation is solid. As you can see, I've moved further down the ledge. The tide is actually racing out. It's still a 14 meter barry tide. I'm practice casting for you on a place called Lavernock Point. I can't cast straight out to sea because if you know Lavernock, the tide is absolutely ripping through. Um, 
so I'm actually picking a point to up towards the beach. There's two charter boats not far off Penarth Pier. So I'm using that as my 12 o'clock direction. There's two boats there as I look at them. They're probably they're quite close together. And my lead is landing directly in between them every time. So casting hasn't been easy since I came back a few weeks ago because I've had, I had eight months, seven to eight months off. I was used to casting a 12 foot three pound carp rather than three ounce lead, 50 yards. And then if I think I could have come back straight away and picked up a 15 foot rod with an eight ounce lead and cast like I did last year, I'm mistaken. So I haven't had any casting practice since I come back over the last couple of weeks. I've done six fishing trips since I've been back. I've been to the Spit twice, I've been to Sully Island, I've been to Lady Bay, um, I went to Fonte and I went to the foreshore. So I've been out six times, no casting, but my casting's been fishing. So it's been 50-50. Normally when I go fishing, nine out of 10, my casts are perfect. But the last six trips, I'm probably talking 50%, maybe a bit less. So it's nice to get out today and do a few casts. Still feel very rusty. But I know when I go wrong in my head, because I've been doing it for so long, I know where I'm going wrong, if that makes sense. So, um, another little tip I can give you with casting is don't go practice casting with a five or a six ounce lead and then go in fishing the next day and finding out it feels completely wrong. So if you use a seven ounce lead when you're fishing, practice casting with an eight ounce. If you fish with a six ounce, cast with a seven ounce. Because I know the bait can be a bit more of an ounce sometimes, maybe two, three ounces, but you'll be surprised how more comfortable you'll be practice casting with a heavier lead. So when you go to a lighter lead and a bait, there won't be much in it at all. So if I'm practice casting with a six ounce or a seven ounce, and then I go fishing with a seven ounce and a whole squid, it's gonna be completely you, you know you will feel a difference so it's always better to practice casting with a heavier lead um, so I'm going to carry on with a few more casts and um, see how it goes I hope you found the casting video useful. A few days later, I found myself fishing for codlin down Cardiff with a few friends, which made for an interesting session. Ooh, my arm is going to fall off. Morning. You joined us somewhere a little bit different today. And a hunt for a cod. We've been here uh, a good two hours already, but uh, we've had a few cod in now. Um, Mr. Cooper is doing the business at the moment. He's had two out, so about two two pounds, something like that. Um, I managed to winkle a small one out myself, and Richie has missed one. Uh, spat the bait out about 10, 20 yards out. The tactics today are short 18 inch to two foot pulleys, mixture of ragworm, blacks, blows, crab, bluey and squid. You know, I'm not a massive fan of worm, um, I prefer big fish baits but I've got fish baits on the one rod, I've got worm on the other rod and I'm tipping that off with either squid one cast or crab the next cast. Um, I had my codlin on uh, straight ragworm. So I think John had his on double squid and what was your other one John? Squid and black. 
squid and black. Believe it or not, you wouldn't think six hours ago it was blowing 40 mile an hour. It's lovely and flat now, so fingers crossed. Right, I'm going through a bait up. This is a rig I just brought in, so I'm just going to add to it. That was crab, black and rag, that was. So I'm literally just going to add to it. Nice big ragworm from a Wenny Anglin. Cheers, Keith. Crab as well. Yes, so the hunt for a cod or codlin. I must apologise about all the mess behind us. Um, it gives it gives us all anglers a bad name. It's really bad. There's everything from picnic seats, to bottles, to broken umbrellas, to broken shelters, to everything. There's even a pack of paracetamol on the floor. Well, a bit messy. Crab, black, ragworm, bunched together as a sausage, nice and the hooks nice and close together. So I'm not a massive fan of worms going right up the snud where the hooks are six, eight inches apart. I like to get the hooks as close together as possible. Every everyone's different. So yes. We are hoping for that cod or codlin on camera. So we've had three already and missed one. Well not missed one, spat the up close in. So let's see what the session brings. Feel like nice. Oh, that's holding that, isn't it? Oh, here we go. Staying down deep as well. Get the camera. Get the smile on his face. On the Yeah, it's been down the side now. That was a cod, Lynn. Lovely red. That's the first one we've had in a day, like. Oh, mate, we've bitten half. Oh, yeah, a congold of it, look. Oh, my God, bring that up. Look at that. Richie just had this co um, codling, though. You can see there, 
don't know if you can pick it up on camera, the mouth mark right the way around. That's got to be six to eight inches. That's a 20 pound deal, that is. I grab that and I let go on the way in. Uh, and it's punctured that side as well, look. That's a big fish, that is. Nice to see a codlin in the day. <laughs> What's the chances of that? <laughs> You're on the laugh. <laughs> That's just mental dog fish, you? <laughs> What a joke. He's only got two codlin on the same trace. <laughs> oh, class. I would have loved to have seen Richie's eel. Maybe next time. Thank you for watching. Keep an eye out for more videos.